Hey, this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. This show is brought to you by Pariah Pickups, handcrafting the very best guitar pickups all the way down in Detroit City. Check them out at pariahpickups.com. And to support the No Sleep Till Sudbury show on Patreon, visit patreon.com slash Brent Jensen Music. I'm joined this week by my pal Tom Jokic. He's the producer of the Chum FM Morning Show and has been for more than 20 years. Tom's always got a good story for me, but today he's got five. And he's here, live in my studio, to recount them for us in person. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tom Jokic. Tommy, welcome to my home. Why, thank you. Did it look like this two years ago? It did, actually. Why? So... I was supposed to be here. You were. I think exactly two years ago today, if I'm not mistaken. That's a crazy thing, <laughs> isn't it? So t- I think to the day, yeah, you were scheduled to be on the show. We were going to record it down here in my little studio here, and COVID happened. That's right. And I had to reschedule, and Amy actually filled in for you. She took your place in, in the schedule. Really? <laughs> yeah, and we recorded it right here. Oh, I haven't heard that episode. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah, because Amy and I have recently uh, met. So, and That's she's right. awesome. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. It is so weird. And it's hard to imagine that it's actually been two years. Mm-hmm. Things look like they're getting better and fingers crossed and toes crossed that they, they are in fact. And that, you know, life can resume to a certain extent fairly normally in the next few months. And... Not more importantly, obviously, a return to normal for everybody is the most important thing. But also, music, the music industry. Yes. These people will need us now, or at least in a few months, more than they ever have. Certainly. Right? You know, we stream whatever your, is it $10 a month or $12 a month for Apple Music or whatever. Mm -hmm. You get all the music you want. But every once in a while, especially with Canadian artists, when they release a new song, I'll go buy the song from iTunes for $1.29 or whatever just to support them, right? Now, I'm only doing it a few times a year, so it's not killing me, but supporting our artists by buying a hard copy or downloading a copy online and paying for it properly, I think they need us, especially the smaller artists. They truly do, yeah. Yeah. I make a point of bringing on up-and-coming artists. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Justine Giles was on. Right. Up-and-coming artists have got like a whole stable of these folks that, you know, I've, I, I love them. I think they're fantastic. They deserve, you know, a shout out. Yeah. And if I can help them in, you know, spreading the good word for them in any way, I certainly will. So. Well, let's also talk about the fact that you did that. You totally put your money where your mouth is because... Just a few months ago, right in this backyard, you <laughs> held an event for one of your favorite guys, Stephen Stanley. That's right. And, you know, everybody pays a few bucks to get there. So it goes to the artist. Like, like talk about stepping up in a very small way, but in a very big way for an artist like that. And, you know, I, I got to be honest, I really didn't know any of his music. He was outstanding. And it was so beautiful on a nice summer's night to hear this music floating through the air in a neighborhood. Yeah. Right. It was so unusual. It was so rare. And it was really kind of beautiful. So, you know, you know, I don't know how many times he's thanked you, but just as someone (laughs) as someone in the audience, I thank you so much for doing that. It was a beautiful night. Thanks, Tom. That's great. That was uh, that was just good times all around. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen, Chris Bennett, his guitar player was also here. Yes. Uh, They had a blast. All my neighbors were here. They enjoyed the show, too. Um, even people who weren't in the backyard, you know, were probably sitting by their windows with a yes. glass of wine and, and, and listening, you know, and the weather was great. Like it was just a, just a fantastic yeah, evening. Yeah, that's right. So that's yeah, right. Uh, I, I'm going to do that again this summer. I, you know, Stephen will probably come back. Maybe we'll bring some other people in too. Sure. You know, we'll sure. Like a little mini festival. Do in you the have backyard. a line on like Ace Fraley or something like that? <laughs> you know what though? Even if you booked them, does that... Probably a 70-30 chance that he would not That's show. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. Anyway. So, Tom, you today, you're going to do something a little bit different. Yeah. So what I want to do is you and I have talked a lot recently. And one of the things we talked about is some of the interviews that you and I have done. Mm-hmm. And so we thought that for this one, I would pick my top five songs for people that I've interviewed. 
Yes. So these interviews have been done over the years. I'd say they some of them go back well well over 20 years. Some of them are a little bit more recent, but all of them have to do with my job, you know, for 32 and a half years as the producer of the Chum FM morning show mm-hmm. in Toronto. Yes. And so that's, you know, just one part of it. The other part of it is that around, you know, about four or five years ago, I got the uh, okay to use all of these interviews, mine and other people's interviews from the Chum archives yep. to create my podcast, Famous Lost Words. Yes. And so all of these interviews have run in the show as have, you know, dozens and dozens more. Some of the gems like a 1974 interview that we at Chum FM did with John Lennon. Now I was, that was before my time, but it is a classic interview. We've run that and there's so many more and I don't want to get fully into it, but this is kind of a good, just a good cross section and they all have a story to go with them. And some of them are quite good and some of them are really embarrassing. (laughs) And one of them, one of them will actually play a clip from. So I can't wait for everybody to hear that because it's a, it's one of my favorite moments of an interview where I just totally connect with an artist. So yeah, no, I can't, I can't. I was very impressed when I initially heard the clip, yes. and I can't wait to get to that. We're going <laughs> to okay. roll the clip when we get to that song. Sure, but yeah, it, it's fantastic. And you know what, Tommy? Like that's one of my favorite podcasts, by the way. Oh, famous thank you. lost words. Yeah, you and Chris Ward, the supremely knowledgeable Chris Ward. Oh yeah, it's great because you can go through. And, you know, you, you get a range of, you know, John Lennon to, mm-hmm. you know, Elton John to Kim Mitchell to whoever it is. I, I swear you've had everybody on that. You know, those archives contain interviews with anybody that you'd want to hear. Oh, yeah. And there's so many that we haven't even got to. Like we haven't even done ELO or the Moody Blues or mm. but but we've done we've done Roy Orbison. Right. We've got Roy Orbison wow. interview clips. Right. We've even got believe it or not, we haven't run it on the air. We've got a Buddy Holly clip. Oh, wow. And we've got wow. an Eddie Cochran clip talking about Betty Ho- Buddy Holly in the next hotel room. No like, way. So there's some really interesting stuff. We've got Everly Brothers, but we've also got, we've done two interviews with Taylor Swift. Yeah. Right? When I say we've done them, these are interviews that we did over the years and we're repeating the best parts. Yes. Um, also, we got an interview where, with Justin Bieber when he's 15 years old. And I got to tell you, he sounds like he's eight, and it's really <laughs> great. And you talk about a person that's changed. He was very, like, it's wild. His Maybe he wasn't 15. Maybe he was like 13 or 14, but his okay. voice had not changed. Oh. So it's really high, and he's very, like, eager, and he's very eager to please. Wow. And so to know, you know, what he, how he changed. Yeah. And then also, eventually, how he kind of settled down and, you know, is creating some depending on your taste, some pretty darn good songs and right. big songs, right? Right, right. But anyway, going back and just hearing this interview from whatever, 2010 or whatever it was, or a Lady Gaga interview from 2008 when she's right at the beginning of her career yeah. talking about how she's a big Springsteen fan, oh. right? And you're kind of going, oh, okay. So it gives you so you much know, added perspective yes, on it these really artists, does. right? It's so much fun to do. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Famous last words. Love it. All right. What are you going to hit me with first, Tom? Well, so I got the opportunity in 2001 to interview Mick Jagger. Uh. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is it was by phone. So I thought, okay, well, you know, how much of a connection can you make? But you know from dealing with the last couple of years that sometimes you know, a phone or a Skype or a Zoom call yeah. can work out perfectly fine and you can make the connection. Absolutely. And the other bad news is, is that he wanted to talk about his new album, his solo album called Goddess, Goddess in, in the, the doorway. doorway. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. Was it any good? Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> okay. He's, I've actually, you know what? I've got a couple of Jagger solo records yeah. and they're good. Lenny Kravitz, like he's got people playing on them. Lenny yes. Kravitz plays on one of them. Yeah. Rob Thomas, I think was part of this mm-hmm. one too. Yep. So, so they say, Tom, you got like seven minutes with Mick Jagger. I'm going, oh my God. And he wants to talk about a solo album, right? I, there's so many other things I want to talk to him about. But we did talk about the solo album. That part was fine. But it is funny. I never, ever thought I would ever be talking about an interview that I did with Mick Jagger, first of all, because I did an interview with Mick Jagger, or that I made him laugh. <laughs> and I made him laugh a couple of times because I asked him what he was like as a kid. Ah. Right, because we were talking a little bit about, 
rock and roll and older people playing rock and roll. Yeah. And so how so many people, this remember this interview is from 2001, so 21 years ago. And around then people were still saying, the Stones are too old. They should stop too early. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And lo, lo and behold, these 21 years later, they're still, still going out. out so even back then, they were saying they got to stop. And I said, so I was talking to him about that. So I was talking, I was talking to him about, you know, the Stones, how long they'll go for. And he goes, you know, as long as you have the proper spirit, you can go on. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. You need a spirit of energy, not a spirit of tiredness. His exact words. But then I asked what he was like as a kid, and he started to giggle. <laughs> and then I said, and then I pointed out that he has a wide range of children in terms of age. Okay. And in fact, I believe even recently he's had a child oh. who I think is younger than his grandchild. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> but, I've lost count with him, you know, because right. he's just, he's, it seems like he's got a, he's having a kid like every couple of years. Sure. He is rather prolific, isn't he? Oh yeah. And so, so, but, but he was laughing while I was talking, while he was talking about, you know, being a kid and what, and what qualities he brought to that. And he just basically said, you know, I was an energetic kid. I like to sing. I like to kind of show off, fool around and all that stuff. And so he goes, yeah, I guess it did. It did kind of reflect on where I became, where I eventually ended up yeah. on stage and all that stuff. So the song I've chosen is Shattered by the Stones okay. from what's that? I think that's Some Girls, right? Yes, it is. I believe. And yeah. one of the reasons why I like it is because it kind of shows off that energy that he's talking about as a kid, right? Right. You know, that love and hope and sex and dream still surviving on the streets. Look at me. Like that whole thing. Yeah. And then just that whole, I love that rap. If I could lip sync any song in the world. I would do that one really? because, oh yeah, I just love all that chitta chatter, chitta chatter. And yeah. just the whole thing about, and the best line is, go ahead, bite the big apple. Don't mind, don't the, mind maggots. the maggots. Yeah. What a great line. It's so kind of biting, but it's also just really smart and fun. Very sarcastic. The yeah. way it delivers it too. Yes. Oh, that's sucking. As soon as you said shattered, that line came to my mind. Yes. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Don't mind the maggots. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so, so that's one of them. And so that's why I chose that song. That's great. You know, I, you just reminded me of a, a great book that I read about him. It was not authorized. It was a biography, but he did not authorize it. It was Christopher or something or other. And uh, was, it, was it Philip Nolan? No, Philip. No, it was Philip Christopher no? Wilkins or something okay. like that. I read it a long time ago, like in the 90s. Right. And uh, it was a, a fantastic glimpse into who Jagger was. It was extensively researched. And he was, a, I think his name was Philip Jagger when he was a kid. Yes, Michael Philip Jagger. That's yes. right. And so he was a very energetic, very bright kid with a lot of potential. He was an impressive individual even when he was pre-10 years old. Absolutely. And one of the things we talked about in the interview was just songwriting and how of all the things he does, he thinks songwriting is his favorite mm-hmm. because just you don't need to do anything. You just need to sit down and just start writing down some thoughts and all that, or trying to get a few chords together. And he really, he really finds that very gratifying. And so it was another thing that we talked about in that interview. Also a clever lyricist. You, know, you yes. think about, you know, the classics like um, Sympathy for the Devil. Great lyrics in that. Yes, absolutely. In fact, that was going to be the other song that I chose if I didn't, until I thought of Shattered. Oh, and just because it's so brilliant, right? It is. And of course, Gimme Shelter as well. Gimme Shelter. Although I think Keith wrote Gimme Shelter. The, I have the lyrics, up- really? Huh? Yes. I, I, have an upcoming, I have an upcoming uh, interview that we're going to air from 1993 okay. with Keith. Mm-hmm. This is when he's with the Expensive Winos. Yes. And he talks about writing Gimme Shelter. So I don't know how much of that is true, but I know we have it. We have him saying it. Wow. Yeah. I just read yesterday that he's doing a 30th anniversary uh, show for John Barbados in New York City with the expensive winos oh, for the wow. first time in 30 years. Yeah. 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 He's, That's he's great. headlining this little bill that they put together. I think he needs to be on stage playing. Yeah. And I think the part that gets him all cranky is when everything is put off for one reason or another, you know, or Mick's doing, he once called Mick's solo work. He referred to Mick as jerk, disco boy jerk off Jagger <laughs> or something like that. It was really. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and because he was just sick. And, and this was the, during the really bad time in the yeah. 80s, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Around yeah. dirty work. And so 
I think he's just sick and tired of waiting. Like he just wants to put out some songs on an album, preferably blues based, and then get out on the road and play. To say their personalities are different is an understatement, but like, you know, just even the way that they uh, are musical is quite different. Yes. Right? You think about what happened up until Exile and on Exile, uh, Richards had his opportunity to be the band leader truly, right? Some might say that you know, maybe didn't do the best job. Right. I think Exile is a fantastic record, but you see what happened after that. Richards was at the height of his heroin addiction and Jagger took over. And Jagger at that time said he was very bored uh, by rock and roll and what was going on in rock and roll, which I thought was funny because Exile is the classic rock and roll record in That's my right. mind. But then you see what happened after. There was reggae on black and blue, you know, disco. Think about the albums that came out after that, Emotional Rescue. Yeah. You know, Tattoo You. Yeah. So Jagger was able to sidestep in front of, you know, Richards for the first time completely. Right. And you saw a whole new different Rolling Stones. That's true. Now, of all the disco songs ever recorded, you got to put Miss You up in the top three. Right. It is, an, it is a sensational song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know it is. Yeah. All right. So my second uh, song is mm -hmm. Nights on Broadway by the Bee Gees. Okay. Great. So 1975. Great song. I was 13 when it came out and I, I knew about the Bee Gees that, you know, the first years of the Bee Gees when they first broke out with Massachusetts and New York mining disaster and all wow. those, all those, cause my brother had that album. That's going back. So yeah, that's, you know, late sixties. Right. But when they came out nights on Broadway, I didn't know that that was them. And then I just loved it. And it ended up being the very first single I ever bought. Oh, no way. Like on 45. On 45. So when Marilyn Dennis and I had the opportunity to fly down to Miami mm -hmm. to interview the Bee Gees in 2001. All three of them? All three of them. Cool. It was the thrill of a lifetime because I liked them from their early days, like I said. And then Nights on Broadway, Jive Talk and Fanny, all those songs. Right. How Deep Is Your Love, some of the uh, Fever stuff and a couple songs after that. So they quite the history, right? And I really yeah. enjoyed... Uh, really enjoyed their music and I really liked them. And so for me to work with Marilyn on this interview, she does the interview, yep. but I am literally, and it's in their studio in Miami. Oh, wow. So it's their home studio. So we walk in. It wasn't like a studio manager giving us a tour. It was the Bee Gees giving us the tour. Hey wow. guys, welcome to our studio. Come on and look around. And they're showing us, you know, their awards on one wall. And then they're showing us this wall that's a tribute to their brother, Andy. Ah, uh, nice. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, he died at the age of 30. Crazy. And he had been gone for, ooh, I would say, a good 12, 13 years by the time we interviewed the Bee Gees. Okay. And you could tell they were still deeply hurt by that whole thing, mm -hmm. by his passing. And we talked about that in the interview. Anyway, the interview was hilarious, but it was almost chaotic. It seemed like a Monty Python sketch. That went on for 90 minutes. Oh. And Marilyn was brilliant at keeping him on the track. But every once in a while, it would veer off to mayhem, right? It's a long time. It minutes, is. You know? and, but it was great. Now, you put, we're playing songs. We're playing commercials because it's live on the radio. And, um, and, you know, we have people calling in asking them questions. I remember the one guy calls up and he says, you know, how, you guys, how have you guys stayed on top all these years? And this is in 2001. And they said, well, you know what? We haven't. We just have known that when we're not having hit records, that we're still going to work. We're going to tour together. We're going to write songs for other people, which they did great a lot in the 80s. And so, you know, they had a really great perspective on things and they got along really well. In real life, they didn't really get along all that well. I don't mm. know if you've seen the, B the Bee Gees documentary, the recent one. No. It's excellent. You know, when they were just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze with us, they were so much fun and it was really a like a wonderful and kind of a warm experience my favorite of the three is morris gibb and he's the one who passed away like a year and a half after this interview this oh, is one wow. of the last major interviews that they did long form interviews that the three of them did while the three of them were still alive right at one point marilyn asks right at the end we always do kind of a rapid fire thing at the end just to kind of get to know you and you can do as many or as few as you want for time, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great general interest thing, 
but it's also good for controlling time because you have to be done in like seven minutes or whatever. Right. So guys, let's ask you a whole bunch of, you know, uh, rapid fire questions, you know, uh, what was the first instrument you ever played or something like that? Anyway, Marilyn says, what annoys your wives most about you? Morris says, oh, the moment I walk in the door. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so it was so much fun and it was like a laugh a minute. And like I said, it was a Monty, it was like a Monty Python sketch. Thankfully, I'm a Monty Python fan. So I thought it was hilarious, but it was like wrangling cats for sure. Oh, I'm sure. Now, who is the third? There's Barry, Maurice, and who? Who's the third one? So, so um, uh, the third one is Robin. That's and right. And Robin passed away a few years after right. that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But but Morris is just so, he, he was very charming and very funny. He was also the one who was chain smoking for, throughout the entire interview. Oh, really? One after another. So mm. I'm sure that had a, a, a you know bad effect on his health. And I think yeah. he was... I don't know. I think he was in his fifties when he died, right? So, oh, jeez. Yeah. So anyway, okay. Want me to keep going here, buddy? Please do. All right. <laughs> what else you got? So in 1995, I interviewed Stephen Stills of Crosby, Stills and Nash. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so the song I'm choosing, yep. is a "Sweet Judy Blue Eyes," which he wrote for Judy Collins. Of that era, of that kind of singer-songwriter, folky, folky folk rock era. This is one of my favorite songs and it's so beautiful and it's like epic. It's almost like prog rock. Too, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So I love the song. The interview with Stephen Stills was another matter altogether. These other two, you know, Mick and the Bee Gees, they were really good experiences. Yeah. Like it started okay. We're talking about, you know, whatever, whatever it was, it started off really well. And then I said to him, Stephen, Crosby, Stills and Nash have always People have always quit the band and then come back. What's the story there? And he turned on me on a dime, right? He said, you know what? It was planned that way. You guys in the music press, it's like your heads are made of cement. It was always <laughs> planned that way. I don't know how you guys don't get this, right? But it was just one of those moments. So that's funny, but also it's alarming Yes. for you. So you're sitting face to face with this guy. A legend. Yeah, and and he turns on you. Yes, and throws that at you. Yeah. Now, as an interviewer, what do you do? If it happened now, I would probably say, you know what? Sorry, I didn't mean any offense by it. I, mm -hmm. I'm asking the question out of curiosity, but I think my reaction in that moment was actually better. Yeah. I just said, oh, I see. Oh, so it was always the plan then. Good for you. Right. So I just instead of reacting to the tone and the aggressiveness of his of his answer. I just reacted to what he said. Mm -hmm. I actually, when I heard it yesterday, I just went, you know what? It's pretty good. Like what I did, how I reacted there was good. It's just one of those moments and it honestly makes me laugh. And in our podcast, we have a segment called When Rock Stars Attack. Yeah. And we've used that <laughs> in When Rock Stars Attack. It's just a funny moment. It makes me laugh. There's, you know, there's a few times where interviews don't go well. You know, yeah. Marilyn and I did an interview with uh, Brian Adams, I would say in the early 2000s. Maybe around 2005, actually. Yep. And it was horrible. It was a terrible, terrible situation. Brian was in a bad way for some reason. Mm. He was in a bad mood. Um, I had written some questions that I think he took some issue with. Now, really? fortunately, he takes that out on the interviewer. Okay. I wasn't the one asking the questions. Mm. Marilyn was. Mm. And he kind of took it out. It was, it was a bad scene for about seven, eight minutes. It was either an hour or an hour and a half interview. Wow. And so I feel bad even thinking about it. So these things happen every once in a while. Yeah. Where people reject what you're saying or something else is playing on them during that day. Mm -hmm. But, and as much as I like Brian Adams' music, and he did come back and do another interview with us months, months later. Mm -hmm. he, by the way, he had to apologize. Good. For his, now, now, tell me about that. Did you put his feet to the fire and say... You know, I think you owe Marilyn an apology. No, no, he didn't. It didn't happen right away. It, okay. it happened uh, days and weeks later. Okay. Just suffice it to say that it was a really tough experience for both of us. Certainly. And it really did color our, how we saw him mm. as a, as a person. As a person, sure. Now, he joined us in Barbados about six months later okay. and was on the air. Fantastic. Mm. Like, and he was great and he was very friendly and he seemed to have... Whatever was bothering him on that day was great. 
And so because it went really well with him, and we were nervous, right? We're ready to go sure. on the air after this had happened, you know, six, eight months earlier. Yeah. And um, and he was great. You want to forgive a person for that? And we did. Yeah. But there's still part of it that goes, nah, I remember what you were like in that moment. Sure. And that was weird and it was hostile and it was just not a great, not a great moment for us. Yeah. I, you know, when I, I'm with you, I don't, I don't know if I could look past that. I just don't see how someone can do that. You're having a bad day, you know, whatever. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with it. Yeah. I just don't. Yeah. So anyway. I would never do that. So that's my story about Stephen Stills. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we got to Brian, but yeah. Well, good for you, you know, for not picking a Brian Adams clip. That's right. That's right. Oh, no. You know what? Like I said, that was probably 12, 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. I haven't listened to the interview since because it's such a bad feeling. Like even talking about it, it's a bad feeling. Was that live or was it pretty Live, buddy. Oh. Live. If it, was on, if it was on tape, we could have edited all the bad stuff out. Sure. Right? Yeah. That's true. Now, what happened is, I think it was live on our station, on Chum in Toronto. Mm-hmm. But I think what happened is we turned it from a 90-minute into a one-hour show with all the good stuff in. Okay. And then sent it out to the network. Hmm. I think that's what happened. So it's a good. that's a good question because it was originally 90 minutes live. Then we did a good edit on it and just sent it out as a one-hour interview with songs from his new album. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but often they were coast to coast live in, you know, that's that's crazy because there's a lot on that. There's a lot on the line there. Well, certainly there is. And artists who do that don't do themselves any favors, by the yeah. way. You know, yeah. people hear that and, and mm-hmm. that gives you a glimpse into who the person truly is. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you're not doing yourself any favors by yes. not carrying yourself with, with a certain amount of grace. It is interesting because every once in a while, so when you're listening to an interview with an artist... Just consider that it's possible that some stuff has happened behind the scenes mm-hmm. that was not good at all. Yeah. And then you have to try to make something entertaining out of that or something entertaining after that has happened, right? I've had it happen a few times. I'll tell you, that only happened to me once. Um, it wasn't awful, but before the interview, the I won't say who the person is. People know this person. They know the name and they know the band. Uh, this person sat down. And led me to believe that it was going to be a very bad interview. It was pre-recorded. The interview went on. It was okay. It was not terrible. It could have been a lot better, in my opinion. Right. It ended up on your. It ended up on your podcast. It, yeah, it's on there now. Okay. So when we concluded the interview, he went on to speak for another hour, and I, I, we're only the interview. I think was only twenty minutes long. So he stayed with me for another hour and complained about you know how fans squeeze his hand too hard and 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 that sort of thing. Wow. <laughs> when they shake hands, he doesn't shake hands with Phil anymore. So I it was just it was kind of sad. Right. You know? you know, and it's it's one of those things where that is so not relatable to any of his fans. That's right. Right? Yeah. That that's you've gotten to a point where, you know, you've sold a few records and and I understand that people want their privacy, mm-hmm. but you got to have a certain amount of like good grace to deal with fans. That's part of the role, I think, you know, and I know that people, there's another side and I know that you can make an argument for, well, you don't owe anybody anything. You're an artist, but I I think you do. I think that if people are good enough to support you and what you do, and by the way, put money in your pocket, right? I think that you have an obligation. I I think you're obliged to shake people's hands and maybe sign autographs and say hello. You know, it's the least you can do. Yeah, that's right. You know, I consider it a lot of a lot of artists when they come in to do interviews, they consider that their job. Mm. Whereas the music they would do for free, what they really get paid for is the part that they don't really like that much. Right. Right. It's like work for you and I. Yeah. Their work is getting up at six in the morning to do a morning radio interview. Yes. Or meeting with a bunch of fans. So just kind of like like keep your head on straight. Exactly. And if you don't like it, that's fine. But that's what you're getting. Consider that's what you're getting paid for. Yeah. That's like your job. Mm-hmm. The other fun stuff, you being on stage and all that and or making music, you know, that you would probably do that for free if you weren't in that line of work. Exactly. So give your head a shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, buddy. What else you got? Okay. So next up is You Ought to Know by Alanis Morissette. Oh, good. You know, 
could pick any, almost any song off that album, Jack Little Pill, mm-hmm. 1995. Yep. Um, you ought to know it's just so much fun for a whole bunch of reasons. Like lyrically, it's kind of hilarious. Yes. But it's also like this incendiary song about a, a person who's really coming to terms and wants the other person to come to terms with what their breakup really did. I love mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So I got a chance to interview Alanis in 2002. She was promoting the album Under, Under Rug Swept. Yep. Uh, good album. So we talked about a lot of things. And one of the things, and you know this, when you do an interview, there's kind of two things that you hope for. One of them is that you get what you want. In mm-hmm. other words, you get good stories or you just get a good back and forth so that it's interesting for, for the listener. Maybe you want something specific. Maybe, you know, if you're doing an interview in November and you work at a radio station, maybe you want to talk to them about Christmas so that near Christmas, you can run a clip of Alanis talking about Christmas, right? The other thing that you want is to make a connection with them. Mm -hmm. But that's gravy that you can never expect that. Well, with Alanis, we spoke for an hour. And when it was over, she said, wow, that was great. And honestly, it's one of the most like gratifying moments ever. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, is that I was able, like Mick Jagger, to make her laugh. Now, Alanis was right across the table from me. Okay. And Alanis is one of those people who is absolutely magnetic in person. Mm. And you think when you're talking to them that they're really, really interested in you as a person and in what you have to say. So part of that might be just like she's naturally like that. Part Mm -hmm. of that might be a skill that she has Mm -hmm. to connect with people. But I know that when I was asking her, it was, again, kind of like a a rapid fire style at the end. And I started asking her about when she first started dating, what's the best date she'd ever been on, the worst date. And by the way, I think at this time she was going out with Ryan Reynolds. I'm not 100% Ah. sure, but it was right around that time. Okay. And- and then I said, well, uh, when, like, what about the first kiss? What was that all about, right? <laughs> wow. And she goes, she just started howling. She goes, well, it was grade 10. Yeah, grade 10, grade 10, grade 10. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but she's laughing. I said, okay, so what was it like? And she's passing herself laughing. Wow. Because I've kind of gone there. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about very serious things in this interview. Mm-hmm. And we've got great stuff. Like, it's an hour, right? Yeah. And it's Alana. She's going to talk. And she can get very, very serious. She talks about charity. She talks about India. She talks about her music and the power it has and deadlines and how deadlines are good and bad for the artistic soul. And then I just thought, you know what? I'm going to get personal. And I did. And by the time that had happened, she had opened up enough to find that stuff not only really funny, but she engaged with it. So just one of those things. And it was a great moment. And I've got a picture of it. It's the world's worst picture of me and a pretty good picture of Alanis, but I've still got it. (laughs) And I've got, I've got this, uh, you know, the audio of that interview and it was so much fun. See, that's great. And you know, with the right people, you can't go wrong doing that. You know, I I was talking to Andy Curran a couple of weeks ago and super nice guy, extremely gracious, extremely humble. And he said, Brent, you know what? We do these interviews to your point earlier, Tom, we do these interviews almost as work right? But you can really get us off track when you talk about things that we love talking about. Like for me, hockey. So we talked about, like he plays shinny hockey in the winter. You know, he plays tennis, he plays golf. Like he's, he said, I'll talk to you for three hours about, you know, chasing a little ball around a golf course (laughs) all day. Like you can talk to me all day about that stuff, you know? So sometimes interviewers have to kind of broaden the scope I feel like, you know, instead of asking those generic questions like, mm-hmm. whoa, what do you, you know, you know, the ones I mean, and you'll do well to do that as yes. an interviewer. Yeah. And also, you know, how many times can you ask, like, you still do ask kind of the basics, like who would you like to work with that you've never worked with before? Mm-hmm. Right. Cause I'm sure every artist from Alanis to Elton John have all been asked that question dozens of times, if not hundreds. And so, Every once in a while, you just got to go, okay, well, I'm going to try to go somewhere else. And every once in a while, you try to ask a question that no one has ever asked. Yeah. You know? Yeah. See, so. it worked with Mick Jagger, right? It did. And well, it with yeah. Linus. And he just laughs. Like he it, he became childlike in that moment. Which is fantastic. Yeah. And that's what happened with her too. She exactly. just became a kid, you know, uh, just, a, just a girl from Ottawa who was dealing with, you know, adolescent things in that moment. And she was just, just lovely, really fun. See, Tommy, you humanized these idols 
by doing that. Yeah, good I think on, so too. Good on you. I think so too. Okay, so my last one, buddy, we're going to actually hear a clip. Oh, okay? yes, we are. So it's uh, the interview I did was from 2019. It's with Kim Mitchell. Yep. You know, I think he was promoting a version of Diamonds, Diamonds that he had done, if I'm not mistaken, with Bare Naked Ladies. Mm. So I had an opportunity to talk to him for iHeartRadio, actually. It was on camera and everything, oh, wow. which was very unusual for me. And trust me, you don't want to see that. You don't want to see me on camera. <laughs> but anyway, um, and we talked about everything. So I had a good amount of time with him. And of course, when people think of Kim Mitchell and especially Max Webster, they often think of their high school days. Certainly. Because Max Webster played my high school. I, I went to a high school um, just outside of Baden, Ontario called Waterloo, Oxford, which is in between um, Kitchener and Stratford. Okay. okay. So right. Max Webster played our high school in probably 78 or so. Mm -hmm. And they were just part of my teenage years, like formative teenage years. And so it was really a thrill to talk to him, but also the Kim Mitchell years, right? Patio lanterns and go for soda. And we talked about kind of the history, you know, of those songs and the legacy of those songs and what those mean to Canadians. And he talked about how people would come up to him all the time and say, Kim, you know, you meant so much to me in my high school years. And, you know, I, you know, maybe I had my first kiss when I listened to, you know, Diamonds, Diamonds or, yeah. you know, Lanterns. just stuff like that. And he said that his bandmates, whenever he goes on tour, say to him, like, Kim, everybody's got a story about you. Yes. They all make that connection. Yep. And, you know, he would have no idea. He's just recording a song, goes out. And so, we, we, and we also had this moment, okay? I will tell you that my very favorite Max Webster song is The Party. Yes. Cats in the bag, the neighbors holler, this party's higher than the Eiffel Tower, and then the music <laughs> kicks in. And it's epic, it's fun, it's ridiculous. And so in the middle of this conversation with Kim Mitchell, this happens. I'm doing what I set out to do, which was to, through music... Bring some happiness to people. Absolutely. Because we're all here to do something on the planet or for humankind. And that's what I do. And it seems to have worked so mm -hmm. far. That's funny. You say we're all here to do nice things for people. But I thought we were all here to be reckless. We're all sleeping <laughs> easy to please dreamers and schemers on the loose. But we'll save you that conversation. You do know for, your lyrics, don't God. you? That's great. We're all here for a celebrate. Anyway, that's right. And I do it in Here's your voice. Here's Lucy. She's choose <laughs> you who calls her, her on the phone. phone. Yeah. She's from a very, very rich foreign family, family but, but displaced because, because of rivalry, rivalry at home. home. Yeah, man. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Wasn't that great? <laughs> I can't believe that you kept up with them word for word. Well, I know that song. Like, I know every single one of those words. It's just one of those geeky things that, you know, a 16-year-old me would have just, like, fallen for, right? We learned that stuff, and I know every note of that song. There's just some songs that you just know every single note and beat and everything. It's like it's like Rush, right? Oh, yeah. You put on Spirit of Radio, and I can almost picture the music in my mind. And that was one of those songs that just stuck to me like glue. But it gets, the Lucy part gets really tricky, yeah. but you stayed with him and like you hear how excited he is that you could, he's like, yeah, <laughs> that's so great. It loves I know, enthusiasm. It, it's a funny moment because, you know, I think I'm just being a smart ass. Yeah. And then he goes with it. And not only does he go with it, he's really happy that yeah. we both did that together. Exactly. Right. It's a, it's a strange and wonderful moment because I'm going, oh, wow. That wasn't just me that enjoyed it. He loved that, yep. right? Yeah. And of course, Kim has, you know, a history in radio. He worked at Q107 for a long time yes. and was great on the air. And one of my favorite things about, about him is he wasn't your average DJ, right? He wasn't, he wasn't trained in radio, mm -hmm. but he had a thing called Damn, I Wish I Wrote That, where yes. he would talk about a song that he, had, he wished he had written, mm -hmm. and then he would play the song. Or every once in a while, he'd have his guitar in the studio with him and he'd play something He'd play a cover of a song or someone would come in and he'd just jam along with them. And I found that really interesting, like just fascinating. And you know that music is in that guy's soul. Oh, yeah. So the fact that he had this radio experience and, and all that, that all, that all meant something to me as well. I know him to be an extremely sincere person. He was on the No Sleep Till Sudbury as well. And he, before we even hit record, he set my mind at ease and said, Brent, he said to me, I, I, I you know, tried to prep him. And he said, you know what? Just lead. I'll talk about whatever you want. Go, brother. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. You just yeah. know it's going to be great. Right? Yeah. 
And at the beginning, I my neighbor is a massive Max Webster fan. And we get together to play Max Webster. And so he knew that Kim was going to be on and we were talking about it. And so I texted my buddy John, two doors down here. So on my radio show, I played Night Flights by Max Webster. And John texted me back and said, you just gave the world a gift by doing that. I told Kim that he sent that back and that he was a huge Max Webster fan. And Kim was genuinely touched. Yeah. He said, oh, really? Yeah. Like, almost like you couldn't believe it. And I said, yeah. We're, and he said, tell him I say thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that's that's amazing. It is amazing. And he meant it. And, you know, there was a moment right around the same time I interviewed Kim, uh, Kim Mitchell. I interviewed Ed Robertson of Bare Naked Ladies. Mm. And, and one of my best friends, she's a huge Bare Naked Ladies fan. Yeah. And so I said, Ed, I know you get asked this all the time, but would you just say hi to Julie? Let's make a video. Right. And so I look at the camera and say, Hey Julie, how you doing? I'm here with just some guy, and then I turn the turn the camera on him, and there's Ed going, "Hey Julie, how you doing?" And you know that he's kind of going, "Oh, I don't really want to do this," but he was all there. Yeah, he was really nice about it. Yeah, but you know, just one more time that he has to make a video for someone. That's right. And so it, it's really nice when they do when they like you. We were saying a few minutes ago when they take that extra step to be nice to a fan. And also take in what the fan is saying to them about the meaning of their music, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like all of them. You know, you talk to Martha and the Muffins. Yeah. You talk to the Spoons. Yeah. You know that what fans say to them now is almost more meaningful than what they would have said to them like 30, 40 years ago when they yep. were big. Yep. So, And yeah. bo both those uh, examples, tremendous people and yeah. extremely grateful. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, like a lot of these artists, um, uh, you talk to Martha and Muffin. So, you know, Echo Beach is a big song. Mm -hmm. And um, I talked to Ivan from um, Men Without Hats. Yeah. And Safety Dance was a massive hit. And they did have a second big hit with Pop Goes the World. But yeah. Safety Dance is the one they're known for, right? And he goes, I'm not sick of that song. He goes, that has opened so many doors for us. Yeah. And that's what Martha, Martha and Mark said. That's right. That song, you know, it's not their favorite song of the, of everything they've done, but they know what that song means to the world mm -hmm. and what it has meant for them in terms of the longevity of their career. Right. Yeah, so, exactly. It's great. Yeah. Mark told me about Echo Beach. I said, it was so clever that you put the chorus in at the very end. Yes. And there was a pause and he said, you know what? I didn't mean to do that. I didn't know what I was doing, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> that's great right that's great oh man this was fun yes it was fun thank you so much for coming over it's like we're well we are we're hanging out in my house here i know it's so weird it's so nice to be doing these things in person again yeah i look forward to it and i'm glad that you were the first one i feel like we made good on uh, that's right on our, our engagement two years ago that we missed out on yeah two years ago today we had to cancel and then here we are and it's great to be here. And uh, and listen, I love your show. I listen all the time. Thank you, buddy. I love the artist interviews. I love the theme ones where you'll talk about, you know, Axl Rose, mm -hmm. your, your two-parter on Axl Rose, or the conspiracy behind someone's uh, death, like uh, like Kurt Cobain. Mm. And the way you the way you lay it out there is really good because you let the audience judge. Every once in a while, you kind of let us know how you feel about it too, <laughs> which I think is fair, dude. It's your show, right? I think you should do that. So. So I love the show. So I'm I'm so happy to be on it again. And I know now that uh, in terms of my co-host Christopher Ward, yes, um, it's two to one for Tom in terms of how many times I've been on the show. <laughs> That's right. So That's I'm just right. saying you're winning. <laughs> That's you right. tell him that and you're Chris winning. And Christopher's the least jealous person I know, so this will have no effect on him. But I'm <laughs> I'm a little bit petty, and so eh, call me Tom Petty. Anyway, so. You know, I just need to hold that up over his head. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much, man. All right. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Tom Jokic. Till next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide. <laughs>